anything in the next 50 minutes. Uh, but I encourage you to come ask questions, talk about it, and more. Uh, of course, questions will be appreciated and feel free to ask anything. Uh, as always, when I talk about this region of the world, I should mention I'm an Israeli. I have a clear side. I will try to be as objective as possible, but I encourage you to check me up. Check the facts, I say. Do whatever you need. And I promise you that if you found a mistake, it was a uh, honest one, and in no attempt, in no way, an attempt to try to, you know, fool you into liking my country. I don't think you will like my country at the end of the speech anyway. <laughs> Okay, so, but I prefer that to be out in the open, so yeah, it's there, and there we go. So, I'd like you, invite you to imagine a place where everyone's fighting each other, and there's religious hatred and ethnic strife, and where winter means the fall of rain and rockets, and then imagine what fun it would be if we added nuclear weapons into the sea. This is what we're going to talk about today, the Middle East and the bomb. Okay. So, we're going to start with talking about Israel because it's, it, it is probably, and we'll talk about why it's probably the first, the first country to uh, place a nuclear weapon, or at least the first country to try to place a nuclear weapon inside the region. We're going to talk about the ambiguity, uh, ambiguity doctrine in Israel regarding its nuclear weapons and what that means. We're going to talk about two attempts that were made throughout history by Arab nations to create a... Uh, nuclear weapon, and how that ended, and why that ended that way, and we're going to talk about, and finally we're going to talk about Iran, a country currently uh, accused of trying to seek nuclear weapons. We're also going to clarify some things about that. The idea is to give you a, better, a bigger picture. We'll try to, if there's time, talk a bit about debate and how you can use different arguments to argue, especially about the Iranian uh, uh, nuclear weapon, how you can argue in favor of it. We're going to focus on that. I assume it's easier to, uh, to uh, talk against it, but I'm willing, I'm willing to do that as well if we have time. So, 1950s Israel uh, is a smaller area. It's just about what's not here in green. This is the PA, this is Gaza. Uh, this is, by the way, the worst map in history. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, Israel look, looks around it and, uh, again, allegedly, Everything I'm saying is allegedly, we'll get to that in a moment. Looks around and it says, okay, uh, we've got lots of enemies, small country. Uh, what's that thing the Americans used in Nagasaki? Oh, we should get one of those. Okay? Now, everything I'm about to tell you is in theory. The reason it's in theory is because uh, something we'll get to soon. So the idea is that sometime during the 50s, probably with the help of the French, the uh, Israelis build in a town called Dimona a textile factory. However, that textile factory is, is oddly the most, world's most protected facility in the world. And, um, and oddly, when you look at it from the sky, it kind of reminds you of a nuclear reactor. <laughs> and the shirts aren't that impressive as well. <laughs> that town is somewhere around here, Dimona. Okay? How do you spell that, by the way? Dimona, yes, uh, well, I don't, it's in Hebrew, but uh, D-I-M-O-N-A. Okay, that is the town of Dimona. It's quite famous uh, in the world of nuclear, uh, nuclear stuff. And then they basically, it's not clear what exactly Israel was able to accomplish uh, with this project. It is clear that we know that if the French were involved, they uh, removed all involvement shortly after. Um, and Israel announces a new doctrine regarding its uh, nuclear capabilities. And that doctrine is the ambiguity doctrine, which goes as follows. Israel does not confirm or deny that it has nuclear weapons. That's the first part. Second part, Israel will not be the first country to introduce nuclear weapons to the Middle East. Okay, notice the word is introduce. It's not have, it's not hold or anything, it's introduce. Now, that is kind of weird. Um, over the years there have been, and just so you can get how taboo this is in Israel, if you want to publish a story in the newspaper in Israel, for example, about Israel's nuclear capabilities, no problem, you're allowed to do that. But 
you must add the words according to foreign publications. Unless you add the words according to foreign publications about everything you write, the military censorship will not allow you to show this, to show that story. Why? Uh, because the assumption is that we want to make it clear that no one in Israel ever confirmed or denied anything. <laughs> okay, that is how serious this is taken. So what does it say according to? It would just, it would say whatever it wants, but then it has to say according to foreign publications. Uh, there's a very uh, nice t-shirt I have at home which actually has a picture of the textile factory and underneath it the words according to foreign publications. <laughs> okay, like it's a joke in Israel, we all know about it. Uh, no, no, it's fine, it's, it's perfectly fine, it is, it is a bit ridiculous. Now, uh, so this is a very serious uh, is, uh, issue in Israel. Uh, throughout the, we'll talk before about what Israel developed or didn't develop in terms of how to get it. But what does this give? Why would Israel choose such a whack, kind of weird way to approach this? The no, denial? What? The denial of... No, we don't deny. No, no, no. Why would you? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Denial of knowledge. It is basically, yes, a denial of knowledge. Anything else? If they confirmed or denied it by giving their enemies cut that heads up, even if it may or may not be clear, if they confirm it, all obviously their enemies will react in a certain way. If they deny it, their enemies will react in a certain way at all. Exactly. Israel believed and still does, and the person, by the way, who invented this doctrine is uh, President Shimon Peres, who's today the president of Israel, uh, if any of you know those names. And Israel thought, thinks that the idea is basically like this, let's enjoy the best of both worlds. Let's have the deterrent value of a nuclear weapon, because we're not denying we don't have it. But on the other hand, let's try to avoid those pesky sanctions. Let's try to avoid something that we'll try to talk about later if there's time, which is called the nuclear arms race. So it was hoped, and to an extent arguably worked, and uh, there are some theories that, that prove why it worked, that Israel will be able to reach a situation where it doesn't create the arms race, but creates enough doubt within the minds or the intelligence communities of, of countries it sees as enemies to not, uh, not attack Israel in a way that would make Israel use the nuclear weapon. And that's it. This, just that's, this sort of, this doctrine was developed in the, 19, in the late 1950s, 60s, something like that. It has been the official doctrine running and going up until today and will be for a while probably. <laughs> Okay? Throughout the years, different pub people tried to publish things about the nuclear weapons. There has been anything from Israel has been creating the biggest hoax ever, and Israel does not have a nuclear weapon, and this is all like a lie, to Israel has the third largest nuclear arsenal after um, the United States and Russia. And you can find people claiming either. Uh, throughout the years, again, in order to give the seriousness of, uh, throughout the years, uh, is, uh, to give the serious of how Israel takes this, there has been only one serious leak from the textile factory in Dimona, a person called Mordechai Va'anunu, uh, in, the 1970s, uh, in the 1980s, was working there. Uh, the guy was uh, a, the fact that he was working there was a fuck up by the security officials, as apparently he liked to go to socialist meetings in the nude and talk about human solidarity, and that's really not our thing. And uh, what happened is, that basically at some point this guy who works at Iwana uh, takes pictures of things there. And he leaves Israel, uh, first to Australia and eventually to London, where he uh, contacts uh, the Sunday Times, a British publication, tells them that he has these pictures and that he would want, to, uh, he would want to, them to be shared. He gives them the pictures. He's supposed to be interviewed. Uh, this fa the fact that he is in contact with the Sunday Times, despite the fact that they were very, very much trying to hide it, obviously out of fear of exactly what happened next, uh, reaches the Israeli security, uh, the Israeli security uh, and intelligence community. Uh, we did what we normally do in these situations. We send one of our girls. Uh, <laughs> after a short relationship, she invites him to Rome. Uh, once they enter the hotel, she booked for them in Rome. Uh, a few other of our boys are waiting there, and he is brought, he's hijacked from Rome and brought back to Israel. 
He serves in Israel for 20, uh, 20 years plus in a maximum security prison. He is today released under severe restrictions, including that he may not talk to the press, anyone who lives outside of Israel, anything like that. He has since then renounced Judaism and became an Anglican, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, in Israel, he's considered generally a very hated man. During his time in prison, there were many protests across the world to release this man. Uh, some of what was seen on that picture? What was seen on that picture is, to be honest, machines that I don't really know what to tell you about what they mean. Basically, and a uh, few experts could. There were experts who claimed this proves Israel can do a billion things. There were experts that claims this proves nothing. Uh, but this is how serious Israel would take it. Like going all the way to a two peaceful countries, one the United Kingdom, the other Rome, and create a military operation there, send a girl there to Mithlake could fall in love with her. After that is pardon? This girl's Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, her uh, her uh, Nick her code name is Sandy, that's all we know about her, and she is uh, in Israel's uh, pantheon of heroes. Um, <laughs> We have, this is to prove how serious Israel takes this issue of nuclear reaction. There is no closer guarded secret in Israel whether or not we have the nuclear weapons. Very few people know the truth. Uh, there's also talk about Israel being to project the nuclear weapons with uh, two systems of delivery. One would be the Air Force, uh, basically using planes. The other would be uh, nuclear attack submarines. And there are rumors that the submarines that Israel received from Germany in the 1990s have the capability of, att of attacking with a second strike capability. Second strike capability is an important concept when you come to Middle East nuclear weapons. Because everyone understand what second strike capability means? Basically, part of the idea from the Cold War as well, when you come to nuclear weapons, is that nuclear weapons tend to destroy everything in their path. So you need to develop the ability to retaliate, okay, in case you are attacked. That is the way you keep the enemy at check. The enemy will be scared of attacking you because they think that you still will be able to attack them back. The only safe nuclear attack is one where you don't have to fear that, say, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. But if you're looking at the Cold War, if America tried to attack the new, uh, uh, tried to attack uh, uh, Russia, for example, or the other way around. Russia would be able to answer. And they'd answer with nuclear weapons, and that is why people believe that they were never used, because of a concept called mutually assured destruction, or MAD. Which basically means you use a nuclear weapon on a country with second strike capabilities, you will be, uh, you will be bombed yourself. Now, you can say a lot of things about Israel, but one thing that most people agree on is that it's pretty small. Nuclear case, so basically it would be quite easy to eradicate the place with a, with, a, uh, with a first strike. And to answer that, Israel and it's Israel probably, again, I don't know. What I'm telling you is like uh, according to 40 foreign publications, seriously. Uh, Israel would have the ability to use its submarines to attack afterwards. The idea is a deterrent. But this leads to a very interesting concept. If Israel is destroyed by a nuclear attack, why should it matter for it to shoot? Why should it answer if it's destroyed anyway? You're not protecting anything. No, yes, no, there is no answer. You want it as deterrence, but once it's shot, deterrence is already over. The deterrence didn't work. What? Yeah, but once, if, if it didn't work in the first place, should you shoot or not? You I don't know, to keep the, I don't know, the place and the, the territory. There'll be nothing. <laughs> There'll be nothing to keep. Just the desert. The concept that is believed that the Israelis developed, and here is something that when I said you won't like the country, uh, that is uh, probably the most horrific one of all, but it's an interesting debate to have on it, and we actually did have a debate about this in uh, Utrecht last year, where the semi-final was, you are an Israeli submarine commander in the Persian Gulf, which is here, let's say, uh, the day after Israel was completely destroyed by a surprise Iranian nuclear attack, this house would use Israel's second strike capabilities. And that was one of the best studies I've seen. So there's an interesting question there. But uh, it is believed that Israel developed something that received the nickname the Samson Option. Now, how well do you know your Old Testament? Uh, Samson was the, one of the strong men. One of the strong men. Do you know how Samson died? Uh, they they cut his hair. No, 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 no. no. He destroyed a temple full of people. Very good. The cutting his hair was how he got tied up there in the first place. 
Well, Samson was this mythological, probably mythological, hero who there were a group of people called uh, the Philistines. They are not relevant to the Palestinians of today, although the name comes from them. Uh, the Philistines, and the Philis he had a, Philist a Philistine girlfriend, and he also liked to be a you know, Philistine, because he was so big and strong. Uh, but the secret of his power was his hair, and eventually he, you know, Delilah, his Palestinian girlfriend, uh, cut his hair, and they were able to catch him and bring him to this place, uh, a temple of Dagon, the sea lord of the Philistines, the sea god of the Philistines, and he says, uh, and at this point he prays to God while he's tied to these pillars, and he says, please God, return me my mythical strength one more time, and my soul shall die with the Philistines. And that's where the name comes from. The idea that Israel will do this as, I may, we may go down, but whoever does it is going down with us. Uh -huh. Now, again, the game is interesting in terms of debate and in terms of what is it. If this is a concept of deterrence, almost no harm done. But then you have the question, what if it really will happen? If you actually reach that point, okay, who will go forward with it? That is the Samson option. So, we have Israel. It, throughout the years, Israel has had, since it has nuclear weapons, a few conventional wars. When I say conventional wars, I mean wars in which fun stuff like bullets and rockets were used, but not the really fun stuff like chemical warfare or nuclear warfare. Okay? During that time, Israel proved that the idea for the military it developed was strong enough in order to uh, be able to thwart any or be a significant presence in the region. And Israel becomes what you call a regional superpower, where that means where we have four of those, which are Iran, Turkey, Egypt, and Israel. The point being, if you're if you're Iraqi, what do you want now? No, 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 you're, sorry, not now. Well, well, we're back in the 1980s. You're Saddam Hussein in the 1980s. Uh, it became clear in past wars that conventional means will not be able to bring down the Zionist idea or the Zionist entity. Some use, it, some use are, are moved to terror, but you're a nation state, and let's just assume you're a good guy, and you hear that the country that is your enemy, for whatever reasons, may or may not have a nuclear weapon. What's the next thing you want? Exactly. You want a nuclear weapon. It's important to remember this because, especially when we get to talk about Iran, which is more relevant to, for today, one of the earliest historical, like the first theory in uh, in uh, IR, okay, which comes from a Greek historian called uh, Herodotus, which I don't know what his name, his animal's last name is, is basically once if you're a nice guy. Okay, the nicest guy in the region, and you just want to protect yourself. Okay? That's all. And you get a gun. Your neighbor, who's also a nice guy, hears about this, and he knows that you have a gun, and he, he doesn't want to do anything bad, but, you know, you better get a gun yourself. You hear he just got a gun. Suddenly that protection you got doesn't give you anything. <laughs> a tank, and so on and so on. And it's sort of like this thing, and the interesting thing is because it started from a very nice guy. It started from a guy who just wanted to defend himself, but he needed to stockpile and stockpile and stockpile. This also fears us because there are a lot of IR theories talking about the fact that if you have so many weapons, what's going to happen with them? They will be used. One of the things that the arguments against, for example, a standing army, when the, there was this question in the United States of whether or not they want one, was that if you, or, and also a question about the EU army, is that if you have a large army, the idea of this becoming the way to act becomes more tempting. Like, maybe you don't want this as an option, either. So, Iraq. It's the 1980s, or late 70s, on Saddam Hussein starts a project to create a uh, nuclear capability for Iraq. The first, would, would have been the first uh, Arab, uh, Arab bomb ever. Somewhere here, I think. One, one facility. How many people want to tell me how long that lasted? Or how did this end? It was it was one one. Pardon? The facility was bombed. Exactly. Uh, Israel, uh, in its, uh, those of you who were in my Zionist, uh, 
Zionist uh, elective already know, Israel, when it thinks, it thinks through paranoia and fear. That's how it acts, that's how it thinks. It sees that and it realizes it needs to do something. I'm not saying it was wrong, but that is why it does it, the things it does. Uh, and Israel sent uh, a, uh, what do you call a wing of air, of air strikes to Iraq and throughout one night conducted the uh, first, oh, the first and at the time, the first and for a while, it would have be the only attack on a nuclear facility in history. The attack is successful, uh, and Iraq dropped the problem, dropped the, dropped the, um, dropped the uh, dropped the program. This is interesting about the Iraqi thing. You know, during this time, it has to say that Saddam Hussein was saying things like the fields of Israel will burn with uh, Iraqi fun and stuff like that. He was very, very, well, he was a flamboyant fellow. <laughs> now, notice this all happens in the 1980s, and this leads to another interesting conspiracy theory. Uh, remember the Mordechai Van Nunu guy? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there are some people who claim that guy was too fucked up. So, <laughs> keep forgetting on that camera. Sorry. That guy was too disadvantaged cognitively <laughs> for him to really ever be accepted to work in an Israeli facility. And the idea was that this was Israel's way of sending a message to Saddam Hussein by using this poor fellow, sending him to London, kidnapping him, and doing it all just so Saddam Hussein would realize we actually do have the weapons without saying we actually do have the weapons. Okay? So that's there as well. How are we doing the time? Marvelous. So we have that, and this is attack. Second Arab attempt to make a nuclear, uh, a nuclear site is actually in uh, Syria, not too long ago, 2006. Syria starts getting interested in, the nuclear, in nuclear facilities. Theirs is much less uh, developed uh, than the uh, Iraqi one. Anyone want to guess how that ends? <laughs> yes, we do. Yeah. <laughs> Israel sends, uh, sends the Air Force again. Uh, yeah. According to recent reports, it was against the wishes of President Bush. Yes, it is true. Israel does get the, like does ask for American uh, approval for most of what it does. But according to a story that was on the news recently, our then Prime Minister uh, Ehud Olmelt basically said that he needs a strike. He, he needs the Americans to strike on Syria. Uh, Bush said, under no circumstances are we getting involved in another area. Like this time, Iraq is already in American hands, like controlled by the United States. Uh, and according to what they said on the news, heroically, El Dolmert said, then we'll take care of ourselves, and hung up the phone and gave the order to blow. And it did. And that's it. And that also stopped, and Syria has its own problems now, which are not relevant to this issue, or may have been relevant, by the way. How could it have been relevant? Because if they had the bomb now, and it's unstable, it could be dangerous. First of all, if they had a bomb now, no one would have been talking about invasion. It would become like North Korea. But more than that, Think of the fact what happens when your government has a pet project and the neighbors were able to take it out without any repercussions. Exactly. It hurts the legitimacy of the regime. This is a national, there's national pride in this sort of thing. These are the kind of things that people protect. It might be relevant. I'm not saying it is, but there is something there. All this time, there is another country that looks at this. Iran. Now, a bit about Iran. A revolution happens in, 19, in, 1870, in 1979, in which... Not 78? 78? Could be. You know what, 90, late 1970s? I, I'm in, I study history, so I really believe dates are not important. Uh, no, really, if you really studied history, then dates are, are arbitrary. Anyway, so we'll talk about it some other time. Another elective. Why? <laughs> okay? Iran is looking at this, and if we talked about, and I'm going to start with the, the what, what is it? Basically, Iran becomes an Islamic republic. It doesn't, I've never been there, of course. I can't go even if I wanted to. Really? Uh, yeah, here's my Israeli passport. What? <laughs> no. Uh, actually, Iran and Israel had pretty good friendships before the revolution. Uh, we were quite friendly with the Shah, uh, but that changed quite significantly. An Iranian passport today would include valid in all countries except Israel, because obviously Iran does not recognize Israel. And I like that, because saying your passport is valid in all countries except my own is the form of recognition. 
Anyway, <laughs> so, I mean, I'm not sure it's a very nice place to live in, doesn't matter. They have their Islamic, uh, their Islamic way of doing things, and I'm not going to go into that because for this quite nuclear question, it, well, it does in terms of rational and stuff like that, but we'll get to that soon. So they're an Islamic Republic, a Sunni one, a uh, Shiite one, sorry, Shia. the other way around, and they look at the world, and what do they see? It's also important that they're Sunni, uh, that they're Shia and not Sunni. What is it? Uh, is Islam has several sects in it. The two major ones are the Sunni and the Shiites. It has to do, it goes all the way back to the death of Muhammad and who inherits him, basically. I'm not going to go too much into that. To the Caliphates. Uh, the Caliphates are Sunni. Okay? Now, this area of the world, in general, is Sunni. Most, most Arab Islam is Sunni. Iran is a strong Shiite center. You also have Shiites in certain areas in Iraq, and you have Shiites in Lebanon. In Lebanon. You have Shiites in other places as well, but I'm talking about the major, uh, uh, the major issues. The reason this is important is because it means that in some situation, Saudi Arabia, which is like the leader of the Sunni ideas, or Egypt, is also sees Iran as, its, as a threat. So, Iran looks at the world around it, and it sees Iraq, controlled by which... Iran, by the way, it doesn't matter. They had a serious war with Iran uh, during the 1980s that lasted for nine years between Iran and Iraq, okay, costing millions and millions and millions of lives, like a horrible war. That's one reason you might want a nuclear weapon, by the way, just that. That's not enough. You have Saudi Arabia, which was supported very heavily by the United States, the United States, the same people who support Israel and Egypt. Very good. Okay. Now, they don't have nuclear weapons, but what they do have is pretty impressive. If you go further back, like over here, where am I? Pakistan. Pakistan. Pakistan, not so much because of Iran, but because which country? Yes. India. 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 Also, actually did develop a nuclear weapon. Introduced it to the world in the 1990s. Because they had problems with each other. Yeah. Let's make, uh, we're not going to go into that. And, of course, what other country? Israel. Okay? The small Satan. Big Satan is the U.S. Okay? So you have Israel as well. That Israel, the world treats it as if it has nuclear weapons. So, and there were some, uh, by the way, there were throughout the ages some talk about Egyptian projects to do something similar, but there's nothing uh, significant. There's nothing we can really talk about, I think, here. Uh, so, what Iran does is, in the early, uh, the late 1990s, starts talking about it and starts developing it in the late two th in the 2000s, is start developing what it calls a nuclear program for peace purposes. Okay? <laughs> you say put, but that still could be the case. Okay? It could. I don't know. Everything we're doing is talking about things we don't know because there's a lot of secrecy involved in but in fact, is, that is what Iran has been claiming. Now, uh, and it could happen because there is some issue with the fact that Iran, while it does have quite a lot of oil, uh, may want to be more independent in energy. That sounds reasonable. Okay? Problem is, most of Western intelligence community organizations agree that some of the stuff they do, and when I say some of the stuff, it has to do with the level of enrichment of uranium. Is has to uh, that they're uh, uh, that they're doing is actually um, is actually too high for it not to be weapons grade. Does anyone understand that? Good. So that is one of the things that bothers them. The other things that bothers them is that the uh, Iranian Prime Minister, President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, uh, thank you, sometimes likes to say things like we should write Israel off the map. Uh, now this is a problem. Okay, I know this is like, oh, he might just be saying that, but first of all, the world is pretty, like, he doesn't feel like the most trustworthy guy for many people. And Israel specifically is a very frightened nation when it comes to people saying things of the sort. Okay, because we have a bad history with people actually believing, <laughs> living up to their promises. Now, what did the Iranians now do? Let's talk about what, what options are on the table. Let's say, before we talk about whether we should or should not, what did the Iranians do that the Iraqis and the Syrians did not? Secure, secure the base. 
First of all, secure, no, 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 you said the wrong word. <laughs> secure, yes. Hide, very well, that's also true. Pardon? From airstrikes? Pardon? From airstrikes? From airstrikes, from other strikes, of course. But notice that I pointed. The the informations what? The what? The informations. On the they, didn't, they didn't give out the location. They gave the more than one. You have a facility in an area called Kum, which is somewhere around here, very schematically, but you also have several other facilities with different levels of accessibility and different levels of attack. What this means, first of all, that while Kum may be the strongest one, the, the, like, the major one, we don't know, there are others that we know about, which means there might be others that we have no clue about. This means that any attempt, either by Israel or by any other Western force, to take this out from the air will have trouble in reaching all locations at once. Iran is a pretty big country. Furthermore, they didn't build it in an open field like some other countries did. They're building these things underground, deep under the Iranian mountains, which are pretty deep. <laughs> no, seriously, that's like... You would need specific, very, very high-grade weaponry, something we call like uh, a... Uh, something I heard called a Moab, but I don't really believe that's true. Mother of all bombs? Yes. Mother of all bombs. Uh, yes, but bunker buster bombs are definitely relevant. Uh, concrete busting bombs are definitely relevant. This is not, if this military operation goes through, it is not going to be one night the uh, Israelis came and the other night there wasn't. And in the morning there wasn't a nuclear facility. This is going to be something that will require repeated strikes. Also, the ability of Iran to defend itself from an air strike is significantly higher uh, because of different weapons that they uh, developed uh, along with North Korea and Russia. Uh, so, now, let's assume for a second that we do know that this is a nuclear thing. Uh, and a lot, a lot, a lot of debates go into this house believes, I know there was a huge contra controversy over that one, Israel should invade Iran, by the way it can't, uh, <laughs> uh, in order to uh, take out the nuclear weapons. The United States should attack, the West should attack. There are huge questions, and a lot of people at least from what I've noticed, struggle with the idea of how do you defend the idea of Iran having a nuclear weapon. So, what sort of answers can we give? Why not? They'll screw up anyway. <laughs> Pardon? They'll screw up anyway. That could work for a very short while. Even if, even if we agree yeah, that technologically they have still have time or, you know, but eventually it's World War II technology. We make a big fuss out of it. But it is eventually World War II technology we're talking about in order for it to be effective. So, uh, we've already actually given one. Matt, so... Yeah, Matt. The idea basically is, yes, Iran may very well want a nuclear weapon. Uh, and as I said, they may have reasons to think that it's... Like, oh, by the way, Afghanistan is over here. If we're talking about more American bases around them, like, they're pretty tightly surrounded. <laughs> they are. It's a fact. And of course there are American bases in Iraq today. I almost forgot that. So, yes, the idea being basically that maybe through the same doctrine that saved us during the Cold War, we can actually have a nuclear Middle East. It goes up further for some people say, quite interestingly, that maybe that's, that this is the best thing that could happen to the Middle East. What, a nuclear war? Yes. <laughs> no, not a nuclear war. A nuclear war. <laughs> Maybe there, no, there are some people who also say nuclear war, but I wasn't referring to that. <laughs> yes, very much true. But there is the question of maybe this is exactly what you need. Why would that be true? Because it's a scare of the balance. Okay, can someone? It has the ability to uh, attack again and attack again all over. Even, but even before that. Even if we talk about conventional warfare, okay? Even if we talk about conventional warfare, if both sides have nuclear bombs, they'll be more careful even about that. Okay? This is an interesting concept because that means that we have a situation where we don't even need the second strike capability anymore. Well, we still do, but you know, we don't need a nuclear war. We can just look at our normal wars and we'll say they'll, they'll behave because no one doesn't, no one will know what the other side will do. Yeah, 
People will behave. Who's getting angry? Okay. So people will behave. And when I say they'll behave, I mean both sides, of course, as well. What does it mean the word behave? Behave. Uh -huh, behave. Like well behave. Like, okay, maybe if, uh, for example, the other country has a nuclear weapon, Israel shouldn't, you know, throw airplanes over it just for, let's see if we can. Yeah. Stuff like that. And the other way around. So that's one theory. What's another? Pardon? Another theory for why it's good for... Yeah, okay, so one is like, great. Just for energy purposes? If this really, first of all, it could be for peaceful energy purposes, and then it's pretty hard to argue. But I said, let's assume that it is nuclear. It's why a, should it's America weapon. be allowed to have ones while Iran not? First of all, you're absolutely, I'll take a second. You're absolutely right. There is here an issue of whether or not it's legitimate for like several, certain countries to own this ability, okay? and other countries not, especially in the world we live in. And if you look at Iraq and North, and North Korea, you'll see this very clearly. Now, I don't care what you think about the war in Iraq, and I don't really, like, it doesn't have anything to do with it. We're looking at it for, as a perspective of what happened, not whether it was good or bad. But the fact is like this. What was the Americans' cause for going into Iraq officially? Very good, the WMDs. They didn't find them, but that has nothing to do with it, okay? But the fact is they went in. What other country do we know that is probably just as bad as, uh, as, as Saddam Hussein's Iraq was that we don't go into? North Korea. North Korea. Pardon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. North Korea. If we believe in the acceptance that countries have right to defend themselves, it can be argued that the only way to defend yourselves against something like the American army, with its money, its power, with the most awesome military force ever seen in history in terms of precision, ability, and mobility, and everything. There's been nothing like it. It, is, it makes the Romans blush what they can do. There is a question why, if that is the only way to defend yourself, why shouldn't Iran be allowed to do so? Why shouldn't any country be allowed to do so? Beyond that, you can also look at it from a bit of a Marxist perspective. Uh, yeah, but especially between rich and poor. If we agree that every country has the right to defend itself, this is like, this is the argument Israel is using today in Gaza, okay? That's the thing that, like, right to defend themselves. I agree with it, but still. Then there's an interesting concept that goes something like this. Nuclear weapons are mostly expensive today because... They're rare. They're rare. What makes them rare? Uranium. 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 Uranium, but what else? Enriching. Only two countries have it. The non-proliferation treaties, basically. It is artificially very hard to get. Okay? It's true that you still need to get uranium, but part of the reason it's such, such a difficult task is because you need to do it in secret. You need to make sure that it looks like it's going for, uh, for civilian purposes. It's quite a, a messy thing to do. Uh, by the way, if we're talking about non-proliferation treaties, of course, Israel did not sign any of them. Because, you know, that would be wrong if you're not confirming or denying. Uh, yeah. But if that is the case, it could be said, if we're talking about why is it fair that the United States has them, or Russia has them, and other countries don't, that this, is, one way to look at this, is that this is to make sure poor countries cannot retaliate. There is no country in the world that could really sustain a war with maybe China, but China is nuclear, but no non-nuclear country today that could sustain a conventional war against the Americans seriously. Okay? Uh, you can make it very, very unpleasant, like how, what happened in uh, Vietnam, but that's about it. Eventually there will be a surge, eventually it will end. And if we agree everyone has a right to defend itself, so it looks like the only way to do so, at least if you look at North Korea, is having a bomb. Exactly. So under those arguments you can come and say, listen, Iran deserves it just as any other country deserves it. Let's start looking at a bit about the opposition to these ideas with the little minutes we have. Why would People say that maybe it's a bad idea for Iran to have the bomb. No reason. Pardon? I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's, it's perfectly fine. If you think no reason, no reason. I'm good with that. Aggressive rhetoric. 
Pardon? Aggressive rhetoric. People refer to the aggressive rhetoric as these pe as this government cannot. Now, I mentioned that the Islamic Republic is important. Because, Why is that? Because, because uh, of the oil? society is fragmented. In... Not that way. Jeez. No, it's because if uh, Israel defends itself against. Yeah. No, no, no. Anyway, because it's supported by America. Here's the idea. The whole, part, the whole point about MAD, mutually assured destruction, is that it assumes two rational players. Two rational players in the idea that they want to benefit, they will behave in the best way to enhance what their situation. Okay? That is the idea. Some claim that because this country is uh, more orientated towards religious thought, it may see mutually assured destruction as a sort of... Pardon? Comparison? No. Uh, sacrificing the sacrifice for worthy, God. A worthy sacrifice. Okay? Uh, it's interesting. It's also was, of course, said about the communists as well. The communists do not think of rationality. They think of the community or they think as a hive. All those sort of things also existed. But that argument has has been there and will probably stay there. Um, in terms of, uh, so it's basically the rhetoric, it's basically the regime, and the other, it's basically the Islamic regime. Another reason that people do not want them to have a nuclear weapon is, remember what I said about Syria being attacked may have helped in some way about, you know, to bring about the, whatever it is we're looking at right now there. There is concerns by people who want to see the overthrow of the Iranian government, and this includes many exiled Iranians, not just the West, because of some of the things it does, and yes, some of the things that go on there are horrific. Uh, the crime for homosexuality, of course, is hanging. The crime for lesbianism, though, is uh, being beaten, uh, is being whipped, uh, second time being whipped, but if for a third time you were caught being a lesbian, then you're being hanged. That sort of fun stuff. So. The idea is that if this regime receives a nuclear weapon, it will become untouchable and it will stay, and that many Iranians who now suffer under the yoke of this regime may find themselves staying with it for a longer period of time, similar to what you've seen in North Korea. So those are not the only, but those are the arguments for against, uh, uh, for and against, etc. In terms of military options, like I said, they don't have that many. This is going to be something prolonged, hard, and not fun, most likely. Uh, there has been, uh, since July of last year, a very, very serious economic attack by the West, uh, pushed very much by, uh, by the Israeli lobby, uh, like Israel is very much pushing for it, to isolate Iran. And it's been working well. It's been working well in terms that the Iranian economy at the current situation is really in bad shape, but very, very bad shape. It still didn't make them stop. But the price of the riyadh, the, the local currency there, is un, you can't trust it. They are using more and more foreign currency because they just cannot trust the money to continue to go. Uh, fuel that normally would have gone to, uh, they've reached the point where they're not, they can't create any more fuel. They're creating more and more fuel that used do you know how oil well works? You have to keep pumping out of it. You can't stop it. Okay? So what's going on, otherwise it can ruin the oil well and cost a lot of money. But fuel that used to go to the, to the west is now actually held in ships, okay, that are used as tankers, as storage tankers. They're not going anywhere. Just ships in the middle of the sea filled with fuel. So the situation there is bad. Whether or not this will be effective to the extent of what the west is trying to achieve, not clear. We're still waiting. Okay. Questions? Isn't China buying the fuel? Yes, China is buying some fuel, as is Russia. That is not 100%, but it doesn't mean that the West is still, the Europe especially, was still a very significant uh, part of the economy. Plus, even if you hurt just a third of their economy, these things have an effect because people get fired. GDP, but, yes? So, can you talk about um, why they, sh like, shouldn't have it? Like, what yeah. Is they may see it as a sacrifice? Yes. A lot of times, uh, that you're absolutely right. That is part of the reason I think the whole non-rationale thing is uh, extreme, is a bit far-fetched. Yes, a Islam normally doesn't really preach the killing of innocents. It, yes. it does have some violent, like most religions, by the way, same thing Christianity, and even that they were able to make the crusades out of it. 
But <laughs> like very many religions, you do have like some parts that are a bit questionable in terms of whether or not they talk about violence or not towards it's Islam. Not. But the issue of innocence is very clear there. That's one reason people think that even if they are Islamic, this won't happen. Uh, the second thing, and this is if you're more sinister, and this is something that I tend to believe because uh, generally what I've seen, it is never the ayatollah, the imam, or the guy in power who sets the doctrine who goes to die. Okay? When Israel was attacked by new suicide bombers, when the United States was attacked in 9-11 by suicide attackers, it was never the guys who had the ideology who was sent to die. It was young, impressionable kids. So, while I, don't, I see many evil people sending other people to die for many evil reasons, I don't think they risk themselves so quickly. And yeah, so that's why I part of it. Even if they're not rational in terms of other people. Yes? So do we have any uh, opposition uh, arguments for why, um, why not to destroy Iran? Like I said, the one of saying that Iran has the right to do it, the one talking about mutually assured destruction. No, the, the other side. Why to do it? Why to do it is basically the thing of mutually assured destruction does not work on people who are religiously fanatics. You just say that it is far fetched. I that's my opinion. This is, it's an argument for it. Every, yeah, right, but every, guys, there is no argument in the world that doesn't have a counter argument. Okay? There are arguments to do it, including by the fact that listen, the fact is if we have more nuclear weapons eventually. While this whole idea of everyone having a nuclear weapon might be interesting in terms of if we really trust man, but eventually there might be one cuckoo out there. And there could be even a domino effect theory, theory here, for example. If we allow Iran to do it, then other countries will jump in as well. We can't start sanctioning every country and attacking every country. Therefore, we need to make an example out of these guys to make sure that other guys don't think about it. Now, and you can prove that it works by the things I told you right now. For example, it took years until someone after Iraq inside the Middle East tried to develop a uh, Muslim nuclear weapon. And you could say, if we show them that this doesn't work, then other people will also drop the idea. Didn't uh, Saudi Arabia say that if Iran has a bomb, they will get one? Uh, yes. Uh, Saudi Arabia at some points did express such things. I don't know how serious they were. I don't know really where they're going to take that. I apologize. Uh, but yes, there has been talk about Saudi Arabia getting a bomb. Turkey also, there was some talk about that. I focused on those where we had more substantial material and not just at some point some guy said something. Well, yes? So if Iraq and Iran, I'm assuming, aren't on great terms, where does that fall? Like, Iraq wouldn't want Iran to get a nuclear weapon either, right? No. So how well do, if at all, does Israel do Israel and Iraq? Not at all. There, here's the problem. A mutual, this is... Uh, one of the few areas in the world where we can probably say that the enemy of my enemy is not necessarily my friend. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, it is true that in this, you could argue that Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and many of these nations have a common interest. Uh, however, even with the Shiite, uh, with the Shiite Sunni difference, they're still part of the Ummah of Islam, the nation of Islam, not the nation of Islam, the American movement, but the concept of the Ummah. Okay, which basically means that there is such a thing as an Islamic nation that we're all part of it together. Israel specifically is seen as a very, very bad force within the area, uh, holding some of uh, the areas of the, uh, of the Dar es Salaam, the Caliphate, and, and basically Arab lands, and therefore talking to it and working with it to attack another Arab country is something you rarely see. Okay, definitely not, even if you could see it clandestinely, like, there have been reports that Israel has worked with countries like Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, Oman, and Qatar on, on several things. But it would never be a large scale, sort of like, united we stand kind of effort that this would recall. That, that would be, in my opinion, too far a step to, uh, to I wouldn't see, I wouldn't expect to see that in my lifetime, but I could be wrong. Uh, that's Israel is so powerful. Um, what? Israel is so powerful with. With nuclear power, I mean. Like I said, we don't know. It, it could be anything. There are many reasons, to, there are many arguments to why Israel might have been a hoax. One of them is the size of where we would be tested. Like, if, Israel, if you have a nuclear weapon, you need to test it somewhere. Now, there have been, now, Israel doesn't have a place where it can test a nuclear weapon. Well, it's <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So that would leave the option of either the Americans or uh, another, like, ally on the size. The thing is, people tend to believe that if, if, another if another country was as involved with this project, 
Okay, to the extent that it would know what Israel has, something would have leaked by now. Okay, there used to be a theory that Israel tested its nuclear weapons in uh, in uh, South uh, South Africa. Okay, there was also that. But had that been the case, the after like apartheid South Africa. Had that been the case, I'm pretty sure the Rainbow Nation would have told people by now because they would have found out. <laughs> Another theory is that Israel chose some place in the middle of the ocean and did it without anyone noticing. So why is everybody afraid of Israel if they don't know their nuclear weapon and are talking about destroying Iran that they know they have a nuclear weapon? Why isn't the other way around? Why are people afraid of Israel? No um, one's in more of the I'm sorry, I, I, I misunderstood the question. Yeah, as, as I understood the beginning of your story, yes. the people, well, the America is afraid, kind of afraid of Israel because they think that have, they have nuclear weapons because of the men. So uh, they, they don't want to destroy, they yeah. want to try. But there is always a question uh, to destroy or not to destroy Iran, and it has a nuclear weapon too. So, why is there the question about Iran, but not the question about Israel? First of all, no one thinks that Iran, uh, this is very important, no one thinks in the intelligence communities, as far as we, we know, no one thinks that Iran has the nuclear weapon. People think that they're developing a nuclear weapon, and people think that they are very close to actually achieving it. The issue, so, yeah, like I said, and this is what I said when I brought up the example of North Korea, probably once the nuclear weapon becomes a reality where the belief is that they have it, we will see less talk about uh, possible attacks. Yes? You have to attack. How, how, what is the view of Iran on the Israeli-Palestine issue, and how could that influence the in general, uh, the view, the official view, uh, and when I say the official view, like there are, like the view of the government, there are people inside Iran who are quite pro-Israeli. Uh, they even have Facebook websites that get closed down every now and then. No, it's true. Uh, but uh, in general, uh, Israel is a uh, the Zionist entity. There is no Israel. The Zionist entity is a criminal state which stole Arab lands, and that's it. There's no conversation, and there's no room for dialogue here. Well, isn't that dangerous regarding if Iran has the bomb? Yes, De for, for the people, like, for people who are very much concerned about what they might do, they think this might create a situation where they will decide to destroy the Zionist entity with a nuclear attack. By the way, there is a small loophole there. What is it? Second. Let's say no, 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 no. Let's forget the second strike. Let's assume no second strike. Where? 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 Okay? Fallout alone will create the place to be kind of sucky, I guess, would be the technical term. So, yes, there's also a question about whether or not any attack about Israel, if you're trying to free Palestine, is going to really create that. Yes? Anyone else? Uh, yes, also, that is, that is also a point that might reach a point where we have, like, at least some holy sites that are holy to all three religions that will be in destroyed as a result, not something that we necessarily want. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir? Do you think that this is possible that now is, uh, the war happens uh, with Iran? Because I heard that, uh, I mean, that, uh, that there is still a, um, there is no denying that there might be a war. I mean, there is still uh, everything. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Well, Everything's on the table, as everyone has said. Yes. <laughs> so you also think that uh, everything is still on the table? Yeah, I, I listen. I'm not as I'm not as informed as the people who make the decision. I see it very possible that maybe they at some point decide that a attacking it is more feasible than we previously thought, or b that even attacking it partially is like I said, they, it is more spread out than we're used to. Uh, then even attacking it partially will be good enough because that will send it back a bit. Basically saying, okay, we won't be able to stop it, but we can delay it for five years. Okay? Of course, the problem with that is that in five years we'll have to do it again. If in five years we already did it, they will get better at defending at it. That's the way of the world. But that is also an argument saying, let's buy five years, see what happens. Yes, sir? Um, I've heard it might make more sense if Iran were not to actually finish building a bomb, but just have everything poised to do so, and then just kind of wait so that at a moment's notice they could very quickly... Yeah, there is a theory that goes that Iran itself does not want a nuclear bomb. It wants to be a very close to creating one. 
The theory goes basically that uh, what it, once Iran has a nuclear bomb, there's no more international interest. They'll be like, oh fuck, we lost that one, let's move on to a different project. Again, similar to what you saw in North Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, and the idea being that Iran enjoys this, and therefore will always want to keep the world at edge of, like, do what we want, or, or negotiate with us, or whatever, oh, or else we're going to get it. Okay? Like, I'll have the, you saw my prime minister in the UN with a picture of the bomb? Mm -hmm. the thing? So basically he drew a bomb. So he said, <laughs> they're right now here, or something like that, and once they reach here, apparently we all die. So, uh, yeah, so the idea is to keep themselves here all the time in order to get, uh, in order to get, you know, concessions uh, in international diplomacy. Uh, I have a slight problem with that, because I think that by now that, that, that it proved to be not working. Like, the sanctions are really hurting Iran, really endangering the regime. You're starting to see protests, you're starting to see bad things. I think that by now, if this was what they wanted, it's obviously backfiring. Okay, which, by the way, could be an interesting question to ask. Because maybe that is what they wanted. We put the sanctions so it's not working, and now they're forced to get the bomb all the way. <laughs> this is how fun this is. <laughs> yes? Are they able to close the Hormuz, this yeah, uh, this, is a, this is not a separate issue, but one thing that Iran uh, said that if they're ever attacked, they will shut down the Straits of Hormuz which is here. What is Suleiman? But didn't they do that? It's, an, it's, an, it's, it's the Persian Gulf, basically. It's the way to get into, it's part of the Persian Gulf. It's the way to get into the Indian Ocean, okay? The problem for this, for the West, is that we already gave up our uh, Iranian oil, which means we're heavily dependent on what? Saudi Arabia. Yes. Which means that while we can still get it from the Red Sea, it will be very, very hard and difficult to get things out of Iran. The economic damage to the West will be catastrophic if this happens. We're talking about nuclear, uh, we're talking about the prices of oil going up overnight by several fold. Uh, which, of course, since we're a very oil dependent, uh, oil dependent economy, this will be a problem throughout the Western world. Uh, if they can do it or not depends on the United States Navy. And that's pretty much it. Uh, the, the United States uh, Navy is generally superior, but in the past 20, 15 years, the uh, Iranian Navy has been developing more kind of like swarm doctrines that use many small boats, which create it harder for American ships to blow up uh, specific boats because they're like loads of them just coming at you. You need more bayonets. You need more horses and bayonets, definitely. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much. I thought this was it.